In this presentation, we are going to go through how PCA is estimated, what is the process of taking data and getting out a PCA model, and further look a little into center and scaling, and also how a biplot is interpreted. So this is what we're talking about. This is a PCA model with some descriptors, some variables describing the taste of coffee at different temperatures, and the dots here are coffee served at different temperatures. So just to give you an overview on what we'll be focusing on today. So the learning objectives of this one is to know a little about what is actually going on when we estimate principal components, what is centering and scaling, how do we interpret a biplot, and what do we mean by variance explained, especially in the context of different variables. So how is PCA estimated? So in this example, we wish to estimate a PCA model based on two variables. So we only have two variables. And that's, you could say, not the perfect um, place to use a PCA, but this is what we can put on pen and paper. So the two variables that we have are height and shoe size. And obviously these are correlated. So the higher you are, the larger your shoes. So what do we do by these ones? Well, we do what is called a centering and a scaling. So the centering puts 0.0, .0 into the middle of the data swarm, and the scaling puts the two variables on axis which numerically have the same values. So from minus one and a half to one and a half, approximately on both axes. So this we refer to as auto scaling or centering including scaling. When we have done this, we take and find the direction in data that describes the two variables the best. And that is this direction. So we could put in another direction, for instance, this direction, but it would not describe the variables very good. And we do that by minimizing the distance from each point to this line. So we find the line where the distance to the line is minimal. And that is this line. This direction in both height and shoe size is this arrow up here, and it will get a loading on both variables. So it will have a, ver a loading for height and a loading for shoe size, so 0 0.7 and 0 0.7. So what we read out of this loading is that height and, and shoe size are positively correlated because these two numbers are both with the same sign and same magnitude, more or less. When we have found the first direction in data and represented as this line, this direction, we would like to know what is the scores for each of the individual points. And we do that by projecting onto the direction each point. So that is what is drawn here. And so each point will be projected down to the green line here, and then the value, the length from the individual projection down to 0, 0.0 .0 is reflected by the score value over here. So this is the first component score values. So there will be some which are high, that is these points up here, and some which are low, minus two, that's these points down here. When we found the first direction in data, we could go on and say, well, we would like to calculate more components. And there the idea is that we put in the direction that describes the remaining part of the data when we have removed the first direction, the first component from the data, and that would be this direction. So what do we mean by centering and scaling? So here we have two variables on very numerically different values. So this one goes from 800 to 1000, and this one goes from 20 to 21. So a span of one, a span of 200, and they are centered at different values. This is around 900, this is around 20.5. We see in the raw data here that we have a clear correlation between the two entities. But what the computer will see is this. So values that are far away from 0.0, .0 and values that pretty much is not explained on the second axis. So the axis here are blown up to be the same on X and Y. 
So this is what the computer will see, and this is not optimal. So what we do is we center the data, and that is to get 0.0, .0 into the middle of the data, and then we scale the data, and that is to get the scale on each axis to be um, the same. And what we will end out with is that what the computer will see is what we see when we visually plot the data. So here we have three variables, x1, x, y, and c. And we have a bunch of observations which is denoted by a, a line of dots here. So for each of these variables, we calculate the two uh, descriptive statistics, the mean and the standard deviation. So we calculate x bar, x bar, which is equal to the sum of the x's divided by n. We do that for y, and we do that for c. So we will get the mean of each of the response variables. In addition, we calculate the standard deviation, so as x, which is equal to the difference between each observation and the mean squared divided by 1 minus n and then a square root on top of this. And we do that for all the response variables. So now we have the descriptive statistics for the free response variables and the centering and scaling goes like this. We calculate for each observation, so a new observation x1 equal to the old observation x1 minus the mean. So what we see is that we by centering, by removing, subtracting the mean from each value, we will get a mean of the new variable here to be zero. And then further we divide by the standard deviation for the response variable. And we do that for all the observations with regard to x, and y, and c. So what we will end out by having is that we take all the variables, all the observations, we subtract within each variable the mean and divide by the standard deviation of each variable. So that is what we mean by centering, subtracting the mean, and scaling, dividing by the standard deviation. So, why do we need to center? Well, PCA looks for 0.0. .0. And in this case, it means that if we have a swarm of data here, we'll get an estimate of the first component being this direction, which tells that V1 and V2 are correlated because they are positive on the loadings for this first direction. And But when we look at data, we'll see that that is actually not the case. And then, if we do the centering and scaling, we will see that principal component 1 will most definitely describe the axis of variation in the data and not just in relation to 0, 0.0. So when should we center or scale our data? If we have discrete independent variables, that is, if we measure pH and water content and so forth, stuff which lives on different scale, we should always center and scale what we call auto scaling. If we have continuous dependent variables, for instance, spectral data where we have absorbances at different wavelengths, or for instance, uh, sensory data, we would say, well, it's, it could make sense to only center the data because we don't want to downweigh variables with high variance compared to variables with low variance. So there it makes sense to only center the data. So centering without scaling. So what does principal component analysis do? Well, it takes in a set of variables and these are organized as this data matrix where we have a number of samples down here, that's one to n, and then a number of variables, different variables. 
and we assume that the data are pre-treated, which is centered and or scaled. Then it decomposes this data matrix X into scores, a new data matrix T, and loading a new data matrix P, which describes the systematic variation of the data. And then we will not be able to describe all the variants in the data by our PCA model, so we'll have some residual left in order to make this equal be fulfilled. We talk about that this is the systematic structure, the patterns in the data, and we talk about that this, the residual part, is the uncorrelated stuff, which reflects noise. So let's go to our... I have some data here which I would like to, to make a PCA model on. So the data are coffee samples, 312 coffee samples, and 12 variables. The first bunch of variables are reflecting the design. So these ones we do not take into account when we do a principal component analysis, but we take from variable 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 up to 10. We scale these and we center them. And this will then be a principal component model. Then we would like to visualize this model and we use the GDBi plot for that. And we get a plot like this. I would like to decorate it a little and especially now we would like to talk about the variables. So let's get the loadings to appear a little bit more. So in order to be able to understand what the scores means in terms of a loading, we can try to say, well, we have all these measures here, all these points, and I would like to know what this point up here is, and this point down here is, with respect to the variable intensity. So the process on how this should be interpreted is that we take this intensity as a direction. So we just extend the line a little, this is a straight line, in both directions reflecting the direction. So if I would like to know what the intensity of this point is, so this is a coffee sample and I would like to know how intense it is, I make a projection down on the intensity error, a 90 degree projection. So the distance from this point and down to the 0, 0.0 reflects how intense this sample is. And we must say that that sample is pretty intense. It's among the highest, um, most intense samples in the data set. On the other hand, we have a, a sample down here. And if we make the projection down here, we'll see that the distance from the center to this point is also very far, but on the negative side. So that means that this sample up here is not very intense. Actually, it's the least intense sample in the data set. So this is how we use the PCA biplot to get a feeling for the individual variables for each of the samples. If we put on this biplot the circle argument to here and take a look, what does the circle describe here? Well, it describes how well are the individual variables described by this PCA model. And what do we mean by describe? Well, if we look down here at the axis, we see that it says 36% explained variance and up here 26% explained variance. So in the ballpark of 60% of the variance is explained in this PCA plot. So not all of it, but a fair deal of it. Does that mean that 60% of the variable variation is explained equally? Well, it doesn't. Here we can see that the longer the arrow is, the more of the variance within each arrow in, within each variable is explained. So intensity is pretty well explained. So that will have an explained variance above 60%, whereas sweet is less well explained.
if the arrow goes all the way to the circle here, it means that this plot mirrors all the information on that particular variable. So what we see here is that we capture a fair deal of the variation across all the variables, mostly for intensity and liking, and less for sour and sweet. On average, we describe 60%, 62% of the variance of these variables. So, notation-wise, we can see that we have a principal component analysis model here. X is the raw data, P is the loadings, we refer to them as common denominators, and T is the scores, which visualizes or shows the multivariate distribution of the samples. E is the residuals, and when we talk about variance explained, it means that how much of the variance from X is distributed between E and TP. We call little t a score vector, little p a loading vector, and the pair TP is a principal component. 